Hello to you, Crash. G'day, Jared, and happy birthday. And how does it feel to stop being the oldest of the young but being the youngest of the old <laughs> when you turn 50? I still remember that day and the feeling that, oh, the zips, the hips are moving again and everything's good. <laughs> I rather like the way you framed that, Crash. It's, it's, <laughs> it's better than maybe I was thinking about it. Um, gosh, we've got some ground to cover here. Shall we... Let's start with New Zealand. I feel full of admiration. I feel a little bit jealous as well, I must say. Let, let's just relive the moment of victory, winning the series in India. Oh, well, first thing, I've got to say this, Jared. Gosh, I love New Zealand's modesty. I mean, you know, j- just the rather sedate way. Yeah, sure, they, they, they shook hands and they patted each other on the back. But an Australian team in that position would have been going burko. <laughs> and and, and uh, one of the most beautiful cricket lines of, of the year was written in England and, and sort of reached me after being sent through a few hands when someone said that Mitchell Santner, 13 wickets for the match, if you don't mind, his reaction was as if... He'd just opened a winning scratchy (laughs) and the prize was another scratchy. (laughs) (laughs) That's how we celebrated the win. You have to pay them. They're they're, they're so inherently humble and and the way they did it. But I I thought Santner, who before it, Jared, had taken one fifer in first-class cricket, whose bowling average against Australia is 104, he outsmarted them by bowling a one-day line. He bowled straight at the stumps as if he's playing in one-day cricket. And he just... They had no patience. And, you know, talking to Bharat Sundaraj this morning, and he mentioned the great point that, you know, he plays for Chennai Super Kings, who, of course, um, Dhoni is their keeper, their inspiration and their mouthpiece. And MS Dhoni would have said to him at some point, you, can't, you don't reckon in the dressing room he would have been quietly giving him tips about how to play, you know, when, when the test series arrived. So masterful effort from a guy who basically was regarded as a, a, a white ball bowler and white ball tactics won the day. Seven for 53, six for 104, hadn't taken more than three wickets in a test innings prior to that. So... Full of admiration and the, uh, just the pang of jealousy as Australia's opened up this opportunity from time to time. Winning a test match in India is a big deal, but never been able, not being able to, for a generation, win that second test. For New Zealand to be able to take that opportunity, it's monumental. So, so many threads here, Jared, for Australia, because there's no doubt that Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli are in decline. They are not the batsmen they were. I mean, Kohli missed a full toss in the first innings. You know, it was it, it was embarrassing stuff. And, and, and you know, they their batsmen now because they played so much T20 cricket, they struggle to hang on to the rhythms of a probing Test match. Like, I was watching Todd Latham. He just gets out there and bats in this lovely old-fashioned test mode. And you can say all you like about baseball and and how it's reinvigorated test cricket, and it has, and other nations have copied it, and and India love playing the bully boy. But sometimes you just have to defer to a turning pitch and good bowling, and India aren't prepared to do it. And you know what? They got what they deserved. And, and I, I, you know, they, their field placings to their spin bowlers were quite cavalier. There was runs everywhere. Whereas the fields to Santner were smart. They were run saving. They put pressure on. And that's what threw me back to 2004 when Australia won there. They, they kept, they, they, they played on India's ego. They kept them tight. That They put run, uh, fieldsmen in run saving positions and said, you want to have a bash? Try, try this and you'll get out. And, and that's what happened. And uh, I, I see in India, Jared, a team very similar to Australia in that they're an ageing team and they don't really know who their best replacements are, which is staggering. You know, they don't know the, 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 their fast bowling pecking order with Mohammed Shami out, the great Shami, who the Australian batsmen, some of them rate him harder to face than Bumrah. He's not around. He's, he has missed this series against Australia. He was omitted for selection after not getting there. So they're vulnerable, India. We, Australia can take them down. And I know what you mean. There's a sense of deflation because it sort of undermines what... If you beat India in India, beating India in Australia isn't quite as that's illustrious, right. is it? No, that's right. And yet for Australia, having not held this trophy for so long, it, there's so much on the line. So I wondered, and we'll talk to Barat as the week unfolds, is 
this suddenly becomes a sticky period for Rohit Sharma. Is I, They played with the assumption that they were going to win this series and then could set off to Australia. But now we know what that hotbed is like. It's the commentary and the media and the fan base is they're going to leave India to some degree under siege. And I wonder what that does to the, it felt, it's certainly untimely, but it felt unsettling to me from afar. You, 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 now you've spotlighted a key issue in the whole thing. When India last lost a series at home to England 12 years ago, social media didn't have the massive penetration or acid edge it does today, Jerry. And it's when India lose at home, it's a huge thing. But, but it's magnified now because of social media and the forces of that, which, you know, was sort of, yes, I know Twitter was around in 212, but it, but it wasn't like it is today. So it's suffocating pressure. And you've got a coach like Gautam Gambier who's just come into the job and he is no Ravi Shastri. I mean, Ravi, when cornered, would pound the pulpit in his Churchillian way and said, we will fight them on the beaches <laughs> and his, his grand addresses. I don't know how they worked, but they did. And he was a great orator and he just got players. Whereas Gamby is different. You know, he he, he worshipped at the church of Justin Langer when he was under siege as a player. I remember he flew to Perth and spent a couple of, you know, weeks with Justin. And he, he, he sort of got, he, he's more introspective and he, he would be easily forced into his shell by adversity. And guess what? I've got a bit of a news for you. There's a truckload of diversity just been dumped on their front porch, yeah. you know, like to, to lose to India. But even the arrogance, and I'll put this one back to you, Jared. I, I, I was stunned by how they arrogantly announced their team for Australia before the third test. Like they've got another test to play, but they've grandly announced their team to Australia. Like, like... Mohammed Shami, who, who's an absolute masterful bowler, they drew a line under him because he, he wasn't playing domestic cricket. I mean, I'd have been giving him every chance and I tweeted a video of him bowling in the nets last night. Yes, I think that the just the assumption, particularly after New Zealand's performance in Sri Lanka, that they were this was the tune-up, they were going to win. We don't need to worry too much about what's in front of us. But what it does, so Rohit Sharma's 37. These are now the last days of Rohit Sharma's test captaincy. That's a big cross to bear coming to Australia. And Virat Kohli, so the question over Kohli crash is hoping for a, you know, a renaissance at the end is one more great series in Australia is you've often said this is no country for old men and Virat Kohli suddenly an old man. Yeah, he is. The, the only thing I'll give Coley is that Australia brings something out of him. Like, he's been a fabulous warrior in Australia. And even on the last tour when he had to go home, remember he was run out in Adelaide and, oh, gee, he looked good. Like, like he, yes. he, he, he was up for it. So, so I, I'm just wondering whether there's one last squeeze of the lemon for Coley in Australia. I don't think there is. I, I reckon he's played so much cricket, he's a fading force. And for, for all his technical assurance, he's a beautiful technician and that, I reckon his eye's going. I mean, I, I keep looking at that shot in the first innings and it's the shot of a, a, a mind that's agitated. So, I, I, and the other thing that, um, you know, was highlighted by the loss to, to New Zealand was that New Ze in, Indian players, strange to say it, aren't great players of spin. You, you you think they would be, but their footwork's become very lazy with the flat IPL decks. And, and they, 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 as I said, they don't hang on to the rhythms of a test match. And as good as you are sometimes, no one in India likes floating along in second gear. They love going straight from first to fourth. But guess what? Second gear is where you sometimes got to be in a test match. So... I, I think Australia's learned a lot from this, Jared. Just put the anchors on them, frustrate them, and you will get a lovely little flash, Harry, dab outside off stump or a swish over cow corner. You, you can outpatience this Indian test team. We'll come to the Australian side of it all in a moment, but just the other overseas series, so Pakistan beat England. And this was so interesting. The Pakistan pitches have been a huge problem since their return to being able to play test cricket on home shores. We saw that in the first test, 550, 800 and something. They got a result because of the way England play and then sort of got about 
confecting the pitches. They used a pitch for a second time and then got a got a Turner's pitch for the third. Jeff Boycott says England's brainless baz ballers are just flat track bullies. If you want to have a legacy as a great team, then you have to be able to win on all surfaces. So you talk about chastening results. It feels like England got a chastening result of its own. Oh, they did. But what about the most stunning cricket statistic for the year was they brought back Sajid Khan and Noman Ali, these two spinners, and they took, and I'll say this slowly because it's such a great stat, 39 of the 40 wickets in the two <laughs> tests that they won. That's only one wicket they didn't take between them. I mean, my goodness me, that's an outrageous statistic, isn't it? But, yeah, question marks everywhere here for... for, for I, I, you know, Ben Stokes said he didn't mind Pakistan producing these outrageous spinning decks. I, I must say, I love them, but... It, it, it by no means am I going to say, gee, Pakistan's back because they cooked up a couple of decks and they got lucky. Uh, you know, they, they their spinners were too good. But I feel good for their coach, Jason Gillespie. He's he's landed there uh, in a team which has had 26 different different selectors in the last two years. Think of that, 26 selectors have passed through. I mean, it's it's what he has to sit there and navigate a path. He's had two different selection panels, and he's only been there a few months, so um, it, it, it's tough. It's unstable. They got players going in and out all the time, but um, Ben Stokes got a little bit. He's re he's another captain out of form, and I reckon the game's really ground Ben Stokes down, Jared. His batting's nowhere near what it used to be. And he let a straight ball go and was hopelessly LBW in the, the, the last innings. And uh, one of the guys, Simon Mann from the BBC, said, oh, I know you love your baseball, but do you regret sort of going for the occasional ones and twos? And quite, you know, Stokes sort of took a bit of offence to it and basically said, no, no, I knew that question was coming. No, I don't. So it's OK playing the Cavalier, but once again, just occasionally, you've got to you got to find a second year in a test match. So, yeah, that was a, a a stunning victory by Pakistan. It was, and in the overall scheme of things for the World Test Championship, I saw the percentage chances of it making it. In England are right at the bottom of the percentage chances of making it. So, for I like the way they play their cricket from one perspective, but at some stage there has to be an accounting, and they're on the wrong side of the accounting now. More with Crash, the Australian side of things. Is it Constance and McSweeney this week's debate rather than Bancroft and Harris? The debate around the openers seem to be taking us back. And there were, I think there's a collective eye roll when we were putting up Marcus Harris and Cam Bancroft. That feels intuitively like it's moved. Sam Constance is the teenager on the scene from New South Wales. And Nathan McSweeney has been brought along. He's about to captain this Australia A team. He is making big runs at the moment where it most counts. The direction has moved from looking back to looking forward. Oh, absolutely, Jared. And there are several reasons for that. And to me, the biggest one is simply this. The, the, the loss in, of India to New Zealand and the fact that Mohammed Shami is not coming out is so significant because it means to, it's time to be a little bold. If you've got Boomerah, at one end and you've got Shammy at the other, that is a classical one-two punch. And it's sort of hard to expose a teenager to it. However, if you've got Boomer at one end, there's every chance that the guy at the other end could be someone like Akash Deep or someone like that who would be just as nervous as Sam Constance. Seriously, you know, coming to Australia and playing over here. So, I and the third paceman is a mystery. You know, so they, this is a great chance to blood someone. Australia absolutely positively have to look forward. There's no way they can look back to Bancroft or Marcus Harris or Renshaw's well-faded now. But, but you got it. That's right. So Constance, McSweeney and, oh, look, from the, the punches chance, Josh Inglis, some people like him. I can't quite get that far. I think it'll be one of the first two. And they're very, very interesting players. Good time for McSweeney to add a white ball 100 to his red ball form, wasn't it? He did. Uh, you know, he's really batting well. I went and saw that at Borderfield Friday. You know, lovely tempoed innings too. Picked it up at when wickets were falling around him and they made just over 200. He made 130. So it was fantastic. 
Jared, he's interesting. It's very, very rare for a player to be identified as a captain before he's really blossomed as a batsman. Yeah. And even now, he, he hasn't had a Sheffield Shield season where he's averaged more than 36, 37, but he is catching up. Look, he, he's an interesting player uh, in that uh, he's one of these guys that does everything good. He, he's a good surfer. <laughs> when they tried boxing exercises, they got Jeff Horn in, you know, the... the, the, the very well-known boxer who beat Manny Pacquiao. And Jeff said to Nathan McSweeney, oh, you've obviously done a bit of boxing. And he said, look, only a little bit. But he picked up the skills really quickly. You know those infuriating people that are quite <laughs> good at a lot of things? Well, he's one of them. And, and they've seen him as a captain when he was only averaging, as Andrew said, 28 in first-class cricket. Sensible kid, you know? Jim Ma was at the Nets at Nudgee, his school in Brisbane, when Nathan was in grade 10, walked past, and he just thought straight away, wow, this kid can bat, he's 15, that's what I call a technique. So he's rising. Um, I th uh, what did you make of Andrew McDonald's words yesterday? Uh, I'll let you go first, and I'll come back and tell you mine. So he's had the grounding for it, uh, and picked a long way out. And then you, you've got the complexity, he's not an opener but you could make him an opener. And then Constas, so I, I like the fact that McDonald's going, we don't have to make a decision yet. And that's right. There are two Australia A games and they're all involved, which is absolutely perfect. Uh, no soft landings in his mind for Constas. You're either ready or you're not at 19. Um, so that's, that's reassuring for his chances. Um, I'm probably leaning towards the not rather than the yes. But so what I would do, Crash is on Thursday, because Australia has a very specific need, I would open with Constance and McSweeney. I know that Harrison and Bancroft are in that squad, but you've got to get the answer, don't you? That the two candidates are there in the same game. You've got to open them together, don't you? Absolutely. And normally, of course, the, the it's the prerogative of the captain, who is McSweeney, to decide the order. But already he has deferred to the selectors. He yeah. said, I'll be given orders. Indeed, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? I, I felt Andrew McDonald on offsiders yesterday slightly favoured Constance. Yep. Uh, j just in the fact that, you know, I would have no reservation. When a selector talks about a player, they never... They never tell you what they're really thinking, as in who's favourite. So you've got to try and pick up a nuance. There was one little word he said about McSweeney being chosen at some point in time. Yes. <laughs> when I heard that, Jared, I just thought it didn't sound like now, if you know what I mean. Whereas with Constance, he, he was. I, I thought he. I thought there was a little ten percent more of a push. Nice. But all that could change. And, in the Australian A game, couldn't it? You know, let, let's be frank. If Constance comes out in the Australia A game in Mackay and makes 120 and 60 and McSweeney makes 7 and 4, I know who's in front then. And vice versa. Uh, like, this is... It doesn't have to be a bat-off, but give them the same opportunity together. And, and let's see. that They've got four innings between the pair of them where they're, where they're permitting. Um, I reckon the situation is just about ideal. At... Uh, Andrew McDonald, I think, is going to be in the studio on Thursday here to set us up for all that's to come. So that'll be game day. Just, we'll do this every... It's a bit like our footy seedings crash is in the premiership race. This week, just give me your seedings on most likely opener. OK, I've got Constance a shandy ahead of McSweeney. Like, it's a nose hair. I can barely speak <laughs> them. Then I've got Inglis behind them. And then I've got Harris and Bancroft. And one thing I forgot to mention, Jared, and this is why it's absolutely essential to go young, Usman Khawaja turns 38 in December. You simply cannot put another 30-year-old plus opener with him. You have to go young. If the kid tries and fails, too bad. Ricky Ponting went in and out of the team three or four times. That's fine. But start the education process now, given that Usman is, is very close to the end. Yes, I, I agree with that. Is there's every chance that these two finish the summer opening together. And if not then, then in the very near future, so that if they are the two, let them shine. So I'll go McSweeney one and Constance two, just to go the other way. Um, Inglis at three, but Inglis is my middle order man. If anything goes awry um, in any way this summer, uh, Inglis will come into the middle order and he's a good replacement to have sit and ready to go. Crash, the, the week of Dave Warner, one part ridiculous, one part appropriate. Ridiculous, the, the push to return to the cricket side. I like the, now that his international career is over, 
I like the lifting of the ban, the leadership ban in all forms. I think my personal view, I think this is an appropriate measure at the end of the day. Where do you sit? Yeah, I, I thought so, but I also agree with the sentiment that the most potent uh, lines in this story are yet to be written. And when David Warner finishes his autobiography within uh, a year or so, what's he going to say about Sandpaper Gate? Does he blow up the building? You know, it's it's just it's such a big question, Jared, because you know if how much he reveals on that will will just be you know it could detonate the whole Australian cricket scene. So that's that's I know the leadership ban being lifted is a is quite poignant and it's meaningful. It meant a lot to Warner. Um, I enjoyed your show last week, particularly the interview with Pete Lawler about <laughs> David Warner, because Pete's writing David's book, yeah, and I know. yet he, he came out with that beautiful line about Warner volunteering to come back is like the drive-by uh, with a clown's face on, and it was widely quoted. And, Jared, they've got... Because Pete's, such, Pete's the best probably people person we've had on the cricket tour as a journalist, he has no malice about him at all. So he can pretty much say what he likes and blokes don't yes. hold it against him, which I love. <laughs> and he gets on well with Warner. Like, he can say to Warner face-to-face, geez, that was the worst shot you played in 10 years. And, you know, if I was saying it, he wouldn't cop it. But with Pete, he just goes, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's just magnificent. I, that's why I love the cricket circuit. Or, or you know, and... Uh, but I thought... Uh, but, yeah, Warner making a comeback. It was never going to happen. It was... People say it was said in jest, and, and it was partly said in jest, but he rang them. If they'd have said to him, yes, we want you to come back, he would have played a shield game. Like, it was it was one of those things you offer with a slight, you know, angular grin and whatever, but if they'd have taken the bait, don't worry, he'd have swallowed the hook. It was an excellent story from Ben Horn. I totally agree with that. Is uh, there was, there was a, a bit of substance to it, and the, could you imagine?